you got this 1996 constitution, which is a sort of multiracial constitution, where, whereby all citizens, regardless of their faith or ethnic background, are in principle equal citizens, right? But South Africa is, you know, still remains one of the most uh, unequal societies on, on, on Earth. In the context of, of, of Muslims in, in Cape Town, the transition to a post-apartheid uh, society also entails, entails a lot of new freedoms. Uh, you know, there was a process towards the gradual recognition of uh, Muslim marriages became in a lot of respect easier for, for, for Muslims to express their religious identity in, in, in public and so forth. Under apartheid, uh, of course, certain uh, urban and suburban areas of, of Cape Town were declared as whites only, right? So you couldn't legally live there uh, if, if you weren't classified uh, by the system as, uh, as white. In the post-apartheid context, this uh, residential seg segregation still remains, but uh, now it has uh, more to do with issues of, of class and socioeconomic marginalization. So people who are not white generally can't afford to move into uh, historically white neighbor neighborhoods, from which some of them were uh, quite a uh, substantial number were, were forcibly removed under apartheid when these areas were declared white, right? And, uh, you know, fears about Muslim immigration are often become completely overblown, right? If, if you look at, you know, media and political discourses, there's not a single day and, and, and there hasn't been since I, I was a teenager in the 1980s in, in which there isn't some debate about in, in integration which and immigration which involves Muslims as, you know, the proverbial other. Uh, so much so that we have data from uh, a national representative survey uh, conducted by the Holocaust Center in, in Norway in 2017, uh, which suggested that uh, some 34%, I think, of, of uh, Norwegian respondents in that survey consent to the idea that uh, Muslims are in Norway and, and Europe to take over. Thirty-four uh, percent. Yeah. Of, wow. So that that's a very high percentage, yeah. and and quite you know quite a frightening percentage, right? Because that obviously also has uh, you know consequences for how people perceive their neighbors if they happen to be of Muslim uh, background. We know f for a fact that uh, Muslims uh, experience hate speech and hate crimes in Norway. Uh, to a greater extent than, than most other minority groups. Right? But in, in such a situation, there's always countervailing tendencies. And what I find in my work with uh, youth in uh, you know, multicultural and multi-religious uh, neighborhoods in, in Oslo, particularly in Oslo East, is of course what you would expect, you know, the situation you describe. Uh, you have neighbors that may be Muslim uh, and you have, have children getting to know one another across these boundaries, right? So you know someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We're on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia, for our second partnership with them. We are now going to be speaking with Dr. Sindre Bunkstad. Hi, Sindre. Hi. Thanks for inviting me on the show. I'm very excited to talk to you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Sindra's background is very interesting. He's a Norwegian social anthropologist. He's author of seven books, associate researcher at KIFO 
Institute for Church, Religion, and Worldview Research in Oslo. All right, let's jump into things. You know that I like these big picture conversations about, are we really all one? Yeah, I mean, obviously, from an anthropological point of view, uh, one of, of, of the sort of fundamental uh, ideas in anthropology is that, you know, uh, in spite of all uh, particularities, you know, uh, there's but one human, human race. Mm. And if we go even further back than that, and we look at whatever you want to call it, the Big Bang or creation or source or all that is, everything comes from one. Does it feel that way? Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm not really qualified to, uh, to go into you know, the, uh, those kind of, of issues. That, that, that's obviously not my qualifications, right? Mm. And then what about um, this most upstream issue that society faces? So this is part of the reason that we do this show is because mm -hmm. we get to kind of like uh, work with different fields on uh, stretching what conversations are normally only had in like a like in a in a that that people may not have in a certain in a given setting mm -hmm. and try and like see if we can add like philosophy or some sort of other insights into the conversation mm. so okay let's take a look at this most upstream issue that society faces do you think that it's our feelings of separation from each other from nature sort of these indigenous principles that are being lacked in modernity well, there's obviously, and I think in a lot of societies uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and, 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 and many other parts of the world, there's a, a, a sense of, of, of uh, a crisis uh, at, at the moment. There's, the, there's uh, issues relating to you know, the lack of uh, legitimacy uh, for, for the political, liberal political systems that have uh, you know, been uh, quite successful since uh, the Second World War in terms of uh, ensuring, uh, you know, welfare and, and stability and, and, and peace and prosperity in, in, in Europe in particular. Uh, there's a profound sense that, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of a crisis uh, and, and that has uh, also obviously a lot of repercussions for uh, how, how people you know, perceive their, their uh, immediate world and, and their surroundings, right? So one of the articulations of this in, in the European context would be uh, you know, the rise of anti-immigration poli politics, which we, we've seen across the board uh, and also a sense in, in which, uh, you know, uh, cl climate change has become a salient I issue for, for a lot of people. Is this such a strange thing to have, you know, your answer to the first question be that we are all one, and then that the, this idea of having some sort of a bias against other people or treating them like, that they're not human or we dehumanize or that we're disconnected from other people in some way or they're a different skin color, different religion or mm. what have you, different socioeconomic status. And then just all of these ways of trying to separate uh, each other rather than see each other as those brothers and sisters of the one. Mm. I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, the, the, there is a, a sort of a uh, a politics of bordering, which uh, one, one sees uh, globally, and of course in the U, uh, in, in the European context, uh, one of of, uh, uh, of the foremost expressions of this pol new politics of, of bordering, uh, whereby you know ra racialized minorities are are excluded, 
uh, is you know the the extensive uh, frontiers that are, are sort of uh, built around U Europe. Uh, you have uh, the EU's uh, Frontex project, uh, which surveils you know the, the the sort of border zones of of, of Europe with uh, and in the Mediterranean, uh, for example. Right. What's the EU surveillance program called again on the borders? Uh, the it's called Frontex, right? So, Frontex. Yeah. So, what does uh, it stand for? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, this is not my my uh, sort of field of, of research, right? But uh, th this uh, is an entity that uh, the EU, in particular, has uh, pumped uh, billions of, of of euros into, right? Uh, hmm. Okay. So uh, and the overall yeah. aim of that is to, to sort of curtail uh, migration, especially from uh, from African countries, but also uh, from Middle Eastern countries uh, in into Europe. Right. What What's the um, is this like you know is this like similar thing around the world like there's some sort there's this border conflict between Mexico and the United States and immigration we have the undocumented migration project that Jason De Leon showcasing you know is this a similar thing happening in the Mediterranean with people trying to cross into Europe is it you know people why are people migrating is it what's the main issue towards economic prosperity what is it the reason do you know well I mean. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, of, of different issues. Uh, obviously, I mean, the main uh, push factor in, in recent years has been this uh, horrendous conflict in, in, in Syria. Uh, so war. Yeah, yeah. so uh, for reasons relating to, to war and, and, and persecution. But also, I, I think, you know, in, in the foreseeable future, we are, we're also... Uh, looking at increasing flows of, of uh, economic migrants, but also uh, refugees fleeing uh, the consequences of, of global climate change, which, you know, by way of a paradox, right? It's it's, it's Western countries that uh, contribute the most, uh, if if you accept um, China to to global climate change. Uh, but the repercussions, you know, uh, in terms of ra raising temperatures and uh, increasing desert, uh, desertification, is experienced in 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 uh, in the global south, right? Okay, so war, um, moving towards uh, economic prosperity, um, yeah, being completely. Uh, having causes that cause you to f flee from your home, all these different types of scenarios lead to this. So then was it then um, this, the ethnographic field work mm -hmm. that has been done by you has, it's ranged across different countries and different religions, different reasons for migration, all these different Give us some. Give us some. Give us some of the taste of the social anthropology. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I, I've, I'm, I'm basically not a, a, a scholar, as an anthropological scholar of of migration. Uh, my research uh, focus and my ethnographic fieldwork. The, the first fieldwork I did was in among Muslims in in Cape Town, South Africa, in the early 2000s, um, and then I've done. Uh, ethnographic fieldwork among uh, youth of Muslim minority background in my native Norway. Uh, and I've also written a book about this uh, uh, Norwegian white supremacist and, and right-wing extremist uh, mass murderer Anders uh, Bering Breivik, yeah. who committed these appalling atrocities uh, on an island outside of Oslo, the capital of Norway, at Utøya in to, uh, on July 22nd, 2011, uh, and also had, uh, placed a bomb under government headquarters in Oslo on, on the very same day. Um, 
Okay, let's break um, into all three of these. These is, mm -hmm. I'm so excited. Okay, so the first one is Muslims in South Africa. Yep. Okay, so what was going on? You said specifically Cape Town? In Cape Town, yeah. Okay, and mm -hmm. so what's, what's happening? Um, because there's obviously apartheid that happened. There's mm -hmm. still uh, some really, what is it, African National Congress and the Democratic Alliance. Mm -hmm. some very interesting um, politics still happening um, and also healing that needs to happen in many ways for what uh, um, happened since like the middle of the 1600s until uh, until now. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, though South Af uh, apartheid as a, uh, uh, as a political system might have disappeared, of course, uh, the, the uh, sort of the long shadows cast by apartheid's afterlife is, is still very much uh, salient in, in the everyday lives of, of, of South Africans. So uh, my ethnographic field work there was on, uh, on Muslims who in Cape Town constitute probably 10% of the population. Okay. These are descendants of, of uh, political prisoners, but also slaves brought from all across the Indian Ocean Basin uh, under uh, Dutch colonialism, right? So from basically 1658 un until uh, 1808, I think is the sort of cutout of, of uh, period. Uh, but most of these Muslims were under the apartheid racial classification, uh, categorized as, as belonging to the so-called colored subgroup, uh, which basically meant that, you know, uh, they were part of a group uh, that the apartheid uh, regime uh, used as kind of a, a buffer to maintain ideas about white supremacy, right? So uh, colored South Africans under apartheid were, uh, in a lot of uh, senses, told that they were uh, you know, they were b better than the majority black population, but they uh, could never be whites, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, and so in the post-apartheid context, it also has to be mentioned in this context that uh, underpinning the apartheid system was a particularly conservative version of uh, you know, Christianity, uh, Calvinist Christianity. Uh, so um, you saw in politics and legislation that uh, Muslims were uh, obviously also by virtue of their having a, a different religion, second class citizens under apartheid. Mm -hmm. uh, in the post apartheid context, uh, uh, you, you got this 1996 constitution, which is a sort of multiracial constitution, where, whereby all citizens, regardless of their faith or ethnic background, are in principle equal citizens, right? Uh, but South Africa is, you know, still remains one of the most uh, unequal societies on, on, on earth. Um, uh, and, and so in, in the context of, of, of Muslims in, in Cape Town, uh, the transition to a post-apartheid uh, society also entails, entails a lot of um, new freedoms. Uh, you know, mm. There was a process towards the gradual recognition of uh, Muslim marriages. Mm. Uh, it, uh, uh, became in a lot of respects easier for, for, for Muslims to express their religious identity mm. in, in, in public and so forth. Mm. Okay, so this is one of the big findings of the first one is that um, post um, around 1996, it after all of that complexity, mm -hmm. um, it, it had become easier for um, Muslims to express themselves freely in, in public and mm -hmm. marry, have the marriages be recognized 
and still about 10% of the population or so. In Cape, in Cape Town, Town, yes. Yeah. It has to be said that in South Africa, it's, it's only 1.4%, right? So, okay. Or, or something uh, like approximately, right? And why do you pick, you know, I mean, there's going to be two more we'll get to, but I'm just curious, like, there's so many different things to study as an anthropologist. You know, how do you pick such a niche, Muslims in Cape Town? Yeah, uh, I mean, I basically came to Cape Town and South Africa with the idea that I would do uh, ethnographic fieldwork on, uh, on integration in uh, formerly white residential neighborhoods in, in, in Cape Town. But um, under apartheid, uh, of course, certain uh, urban and suburban areas of, of Cape Town were declared as whites only, right? So you couldn't legally live there uh, if, if you weren't classified uh, by the system as, uh, as white. Uh, in the post-apartheid context, uh, this uh, residential seg segregation still uh, remains, but uh, now it has uh, more to do with issues of, of class and socioeconomic marginalization. So people uh, who are not white generally can't afford to move into uh, historically white neighbor neighborhoods, uh, uh, from which some of them were uh, quite a uh, substantial number were, were forcibly removed under apartheid when these areas were declared white, right? So, uh, so I quickly realized that this was not, uh, it was not viable for, for, for me to do research on that, and I discovered that, uh, uh, you know, there hadn't been, for example, a doctorate uh, on, on Muslims in Cape Town since the late 1970s. Mm. Um, and I was also uh, introduced to... Okay, uh, so you, there's, yeah. a, there's this feeling of uh, catching up on uh, a niche that hadn't had uh, good research done in it for 30 years. Yeah, no, there, there was definitely yeah. a sort of... Yeah, yeah. Lacuna in in, uh, in ethnographic fieldwork on, on Muslims in, in Cape Town. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So that seemed like a viable option, and I also I I gradually uh, gradually I was introduced to and and became friends with with uh, uh, Muslim families in a um, in a township community uh, south of Cape Town. So that was really the the start of my uh, career as an anthropologist, which I'm still profoundly grateful for because um, you know, with, without that experience, and, and when you're a young anthropologist, that is you know, profoundly important to, to sort of realize that you can, you can actually do this, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. And so get along with people who, uh, in, in some respects are quite different from you, but in other respects, you know, uh, share the kind of qualities and what, uh, the makeup that ma makes us all human, right? Yeah. Mm. This is a very important point, I like this. So then, um, actually this is a big part of doing field work is that uh, in many ways there, ha there is something that happens that usually there has to be some sort of a behavior uh, change of sorts. You have to repattern maybe some of the processes that, you know, you weren't used to, like, uh, inquiring into, uh, is this like asking questions to Muslim families in Cape Town and like learning about their traditions and yeah. where things were a decade ago, where they are now and taking mm. it like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So this is very interesting. You, you, when you do um, field work like this, it really requires a, you know, it requires openness. It requires a shift uh, um, towards uh, knowing how to, you know, be, be polite and ask good questions and be respectful of mm -hmm. uh, culture that's that's um, maybe slightly different, like you were describing. Um, okay. So the second one was you said uh, young uh, Muslims in your home country mm. in Norway. Yep. Okay, so now what, uh, what's going on with that? Okay, so Norway is, is quite a small country, right? The population is now estimated five? at 5.3 5. 5. 5. 5. million uh, 
uh, people in, in, in Norway. Um, and in the Norwegian context... Uh, that's a, that's about the size of Vancouver, I think, yeah. in population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Un unlike in the uh, South African context, where uh, there's been a Muslim present, a continuous Muslim present for 300 years, right? Ah. Uh, Muslim migration to Norway is quite a recent phenomenon, right? So When did it start? Uh, well, we have historical records suggesting that the first Muslim da'i or missionary arrived in Norway in the 1920s. He, he never settled. The first settled Muslim in, in Norway was um, uh, an Ahmadi proselytizer. Ahmadis is, uh, they're, you know, uh, Muslims from uh, a, a, a Muslim sect from the Indi Indi Indo Pakistani subcontinent, mm. right? Uh, and, and quite engaged in proselytizing or missionary activities uh, known as dawah uh, in, in various parts of, of, of the world. So there was a small uh, community of Ahmadi Muslims in Oslo. Uh, and sometimes missionaries come and proselytize, sometimes, yeah. and sometimes they come mm -hmm. to and settle without... Uh, yeah. Proselytizing. This is very. But there was an Ahmadi of uh, Pakistani background who settled in Oslo West uh, in the 1950s, uh, and who uh, around them there emerged uh, a small congregation uh, consisting of, of Ahmadis and some Norwegian converts, right? Uh, but the main uh, wave of Muslim migration in Norway starts in the 19, late 1960s with uh, Muslim labor, male, predominantly male labor migration uh, from various countries, but predominantly uh, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, uh, Morocco. Uh, and so 19, by 1975, this had generated a, a sort of moral panic in, in the Norwegian political system. So uh, there was a cross uh, political consensus uh, and, uh, and majority support in, in parliament uh, for what was known as an immigration stop. And the aim of that immigration stop was to, to curb immigration from so-called third world countries. Um, but by that time, you know, th there were already hundreds of predominantly male labor migrants from Muslim countries uh, w who had uh, rights to family reunification, uh, which meant that you know, uh, many of them brought their families over uh, from their home countries. Uh, and through the 1970s and 80s and uh, the 1990s, uh, there were uh, quite a number of asylum cli claimants, uh, people who sought refuge in, in Norway from various uh, majority Muslim countries. So, uh, for example, refugees from Iran. Um, there were refugees coming uh, from the wars in the Balkans, uh, Somali, uh, Somalia, uh, uh, and after 2000 also I Iraq uh, in recent years uh, ref refugees from the Syrian civil war yeah. hmm. well okay so there are there's this interesting feeling where you kind of have like a homogenous tribe of let's say 5 million people mm. but you have a homogenous tribe you can even scale it down to just the Dunbar 150 if you mm. want for the example but then a so a so-called other of a different skin color, or religion, or socioeconomic mm. status, or whatever, comes and um, is seeking uh, to maybe become integrated with the tribe or to settle there, um, proselytize. There's so many different options. Um, but then this idea of maybe like a fear can kick in where you do something like want an immigration stop and not allow any of that yeah. to happen. Um, sometimes you try and open up the door and try and make sure that people are, you know, mentally healthy and that they will not um, 
cause harm in that tribe where they are trying to enter. Um, there are so many different uh, approaches to this process, um, but also this is very important to understand that um, the whole planet is our collective home and that uh, these borders when you're orbiting in the International Space Station or looking for Mars, etc., do not exist. And so there is also that to keep in mind while also wanting to be a secure uh, a place of security and to a place of prosperity and of enabling people to enter when they have had war or other conflict or seeking economic uh, prosperity or all these different types of things. This is a very complicated uh, mixing of all of these different variables that have to be yeah. analyzed in situations like this. Yeah. No, absolutely. It has to be said that the uh, Muslim population in, of, of Norway now stands at an estimated 4.2% uh, of, of the population. Uh, so it's a that's quite a jump from several hundred. Yeah, no, no, sure. Um, yeah. and I mean, there's been, uh, by all means, significant demographic change in no Norway since uh, the late 1960s, right? So if we look at the official statistics, uh, I, uh, it's estimated that 17.4% uh, of the Norwegian population now have an immigrant background or uh, uh, is descended from, from Im immigrants. Uh, in, in the capital of Oslo, that percentage uh, raises to some 36.8%. And it obviously, you know, uh, that's not always a smooth uh, process. But I, 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 I think if you look at indicators such as labor market particip participation and levels of education, uh, this is certainly a, a slow process, but uh, uh, Norway, you know, uh, is, a, is, a, is a case in point if you want to make the case that, uh, you know, fears about Muslim immigration are often um, become completely overblown, right? If you, if you look at, you know, media and political discourses, there's not a single day and, and, and there hasn't been since I, I was a teenager in the 1980s in, in which there isn't some debate about in, in integration which, and immigration which involves Muslims as, you know, the proverbial other. Um, and, and part of the challenge in the Norwegian context is, is not only that this has happened relatively fast, it's also, as the late Norwegian social anthropologist Marianne Gullestad uh, remarked um, in, in one of her books, it's, it's also related to the fact that Norwegians tended to think of themselves uh, as being uh, quite a homogeneous population, right? Uh, which, if you look at this historically, uh, there's certainly truth in, in that perception, uh, but with, with quite strong qualifications, because Norway uh, has this indigenous Sami population, uh, which has been the present in Norway for centuries. They, they were, you know, in... in Northern Norway, they were the indigenous population. Right? What, what is the indigenous population of Norway called? The, the, the Samis. Samis. Yeah. Uh, and you had, uh, you know, uh, Jews uh, and Roma and Roma speaking uh, peoples in, in, in Norway. So it, it was not the case that Norwegian uh, society was always homogeneous, right? Yes, yes. Mm. Wow. This is such an interesting uh, combinatoric that is uh, uh, flowering on the planet because when you look at um, what uh, you know used to be, you were you know describing if at the very beginning like South Africa and like the year 1600, mm -hmm. uh, and then what happened and where it is now, mm -hmm. the United States in 1600, and then what happened oh. and where it is now. I mean, look at what city we're in right now, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the indigenous here then very white and uh and then very uh now there's lots of chinese people lots of indian people lots of persian people lots of yeah. you know boom now there's a, like now this becomes its own melting pot of cultures in a mm. sense as well but the percentages are actually super interesting that you're listing because nor, nor um 
a country like the United States that has 330 million people mm -hmm. and then like, I don't even know, probably only half of them now are white. I don't know what the number is. Mm -hmm. um, China, which has a 1.4 billion people, mm -hmm. but probably 1.3 billion of them are mm. Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so this is very interesting. Nor Norway, which has 5 million, 5.3 million, mm. um, but then now maybe uh, a couple hundred thousand are actually not uh, 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 Norwegian. And that's also very interesting how these things flower as its own unique like combinatoric and what, you know, what economic and societal mm. pressures funnel people into um, countries, you know, war pressures, et cetera, mm. um, colonization pressures, all different types of things happening. And it's also interesting thinking about like, after even a, a couple of generations of mm. migrating into a, a land like, let's say, Norway, that then, um, let's say that if I'm Muslim, my, uh, my children, whether I'm, you know, from, uh, maybe my, let's say I'm from Somalia, I, mm -hmm. that, or Syria, that, whatever it may be, that my children um, play with your children mm -hmm. and the other children that are Norwegian children. And then they become friends, and, oh, sure. which is great. And, mm -hmm. But maybe even some of them decide to get married and have children. Mm -hmm. And then that's that statistic that you were talking about where it's, I think, over 30% of backgrounds in, Nor in Oslo specifically yeah, yeah. are yeah, yeah. from other places. No, so, um, I mean, uh, uh, Norway is obviously in a sort of transitional phase, but it, you know, we, we, we have to also recall that, you know, if, if we look at this in, 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 in broad historical sh uh, sweeps, right, the, uh, the, the, the sort of nat natural human condition has, has been movement uh, of people and has been mixing, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Movement uh, and mixing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look at yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the work of this famous uh, geneticist, uh, David Reich, right? So the, you know. Uh, we, we like we, to swirl our genes with those. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, who sort of demonstrates that, that there's been much more mixing and, and geographical movement uh, across the centuries than what we, we tend to uh, and are, are capable of I imagining, right? So in, in the Norwegian context, um, and, and we have this populist right-wing uh, party in government, uh, which has in introduced, uh, you know, uh, more restrictions on immigration than any uh, Norwegian government uh, since World War, War II. Uh, and it's uh, a specific targeting of, of Muslims in that policy in that, you know, it's, though you can't do that on an international law, it's quite obvious that it's, uh, the particular target is Muslim immigration to Norway. Uh, but in, in such a situation, there's always countervailing tendencies. And what I find in my work with uh, youth in, uh, you know, multicultural and multi-religious uh, neighborhoods in, in Oslo, particularly in Oslo East, is of course what you would expect, you know, the situation you describe. Uh, you have uh, neighbors uh, that may be Muslim, uh, uh, and you have, have children getting to know one another across these boundaries, right? So where I live, um, in a suburban community outside of Oslo, uh, I, I have uh, a neighbor uh, who... Uh, you guys who, still use bobsleds up there, right? Yeah, <laughs> who's of Muslim background, right? Uh, and, yes, and, yes. and I mean, he's highly educated and uh, his children play uh, with, with uh, all the other children in the neighborhood, right? Yes. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, then there's... Movement and mixing. Yeah. Uh, and so the, to the extent that I, you know, see, see hope, it, it is often in, uh, in the younger generation uh, that, that learn to, and I'm not saying that it's always and inevitably unproblematic, but there is a sense of uh, what my, 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 my friend uh, Paul Gilroy 
uh, refers to as conviviality, right? Conviviality. So, yeah, which is a way of referring to this everyday and, and, and quite, uh, you know, regular interaction. Yes, right? mm -hmm. conviviality like with, living with, yeah. life with. Mm -hmm. And uh, by having life with on the playgrounds from uh, uh, early days of yeah. life, it becomes normal to see a mixing and movement of mm -hmm. people um, uh, that are so-called different, whereas older people that have, may have never seen that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's so interesting. We were talking about that in some of the previous um, interviews during the annual meeting where it's almost as though this, uh, this young consciousness of like stewardship of the planet and desire for interconnectedness with each mm -hmm. other and nature and our ecosystems is slowly uh, coming and overthrowing the archaic uh, systems of of uh, not giving a sh about the nature and about <laughs> the ecosystems and uh, and it's it's very interesting that that uh, young consciousness is moving uh, and also if we look at this sort of mobilization uh, uh, against climate change and, and uh, environmental uh, mobilization over uh, environmental issues in, in Norway, it's is often, uh, as in you know many other countries, uh, driven by uh, youth. Um, hmm. Yeah, we're building the next world, young people. We believe in you to build the next world and solve the greatest challenges that our society faces and become the most enlightened that is the world's passed along to. Okay, last one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Anders Brivik. Yeah. Okay, what is... Um, your argument is that Brevik's beliefs were not simply the result of a deranged mind, but rather they are the result of the political mainstreaming of pernicious, racist, and Islamophobic discourses. Mm. Give us the background on what this is and how one can even calculate such multivariability of impact on one's uh, choices. Okay, right. So... Uh, I, I, I mean, there's a risk of, of, of sort of... Uh, reducing uh, the actions of, of Breivik to a question of uh, social psychology, right? So we, 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 we know that this was uh, uh, a character with, uh, who had a, a troubled family background, right? Uh, a father who had uh, basically left uh, the family when he, he was still a, a child. Um, That's a big traumatic factor. Yeah, yeah I know, yeah. absolutely. And he, he also had a mother who uh, wasn't, uh, from the look of it, uh, uh, very functional. Um, yeah. uh, and so the psychiatric evaluation in, in the context of, of the uh, court case found, for example, that he had, uh, you know, a severe lack of empathy uh, and narcissistic impulses, right? Yes, yes. Uh, but my book on, on the Breivik affair um, is an attempt to take, you know, his ideological motivations seriously uh, without necessarily reducing uh, his actions to uh, a sort of causal relationship where exposure to a right-wing extremist ideology and Islamophobia leads to those kinds of, of, of actions. Uh, because, you know, first of all, there are, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of this hatred uh, against Muslims and other minorities, uh, not the least online, also in, 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 in Norway. And and vice but, versa happening as well. Yeah, and, so, um, yeah. I mean, it's not new, and uh, most people in, in, in most countries would have a sort of inner threshold where exposure to that kind of rhetoric of, of, of vicious hatred uh, wouldn't lead to, to violent and terroristic actions, right? So that has to be, be said. Um, mm. But, 
you know, to, to my mind, Breivik was also uh, profoundly inspired by what is known as uh, the counter-jihadist genre, mm. in which there's a lot of dehumanization of, of, of Muslims. There's an undercurrent of uh, this conspiratorial Arabia idea whereby uh, the basic idea here is that you know uh, European governments and the EU in particular are, are sort of secretly uh, consp uh, involved in a conspiracy with with Muslims to take over uh, yeah, Europe in in the name of Islam and to establish an Islamic state or a caliphate. Uh, it's called your Eurabia. The Eurabia, uh, and and that you know if you look at this. Uh, in, in the context of uh, conspiracy theories, uh, it's, uh, it's something akin to the anti-Semitic forgery, the, the protocols of the, the elders of, of Zion, only with uh, Muslims cast as the, the villains in, in, in the play, if you like. There's a lot of uh, Saudi Arabian money going to different places in the world, though, and that's very interesting to study and follow the money trails. Yeah, I don't know, C certainly. Uh, yes. But, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the Norwegian uh, context, uh, this way of thinking about uh, a relatively small uh, and to many extent and, and purposes quite marginalized minority uh, has become surprisingly mainstream and widespread. Uh, so much so that we have data from uh, a national representative survey uh, conducted by the Holocaust Center in, in Norway uh, in 2017, uh, which suggested that uh, some 34%, I think, of, of uh, Norwegian respondents in that survey uh, consent to um, the idea that uh, Muslims are in Norway and, and Europe to take over. Thirty-four uh, percent. Yeah. Of, wow. So that that's a very high percentage, yeah. and and quite you know quite a frightening percentage, right? Because that obviously also has rep, uh, you know consequences for. Uh, how people perceive their neighbors if they happen to be of Muslim uh, background. We know f for a fact that uh, Muslims uh, experience hate speech and hate crimes in Norway uh, to a greater extent than, than most other minority groups. Right? Mm. Wow. Damn. And, and uh, so Breivik was also wow. uh, a, a product of the mainstreaming of these. Uh, ideas. What year? Sentiments. What year were um, Breivik's atrocities, and what were the numbers? What were what were his atrocities that he caused? Uh, okay, right. So the uh, uh, this happened on, uh, and these were you know the worst terrorist attacks in in modern Norwegian history, um, and uh, they occurred on uh, July 22nd, 2011, uh, and the number of, of uh, uh, casualties, I, uh, I think, was 77. Uh, so, and most of his victims were uh, teenagers uh, attending uh, a youth camp for the then governing Social Democratic uh, Labour Party's youth organization at Utøya, which is a small island 60 kilometers from, from Oslo. Uh, there were also some casualties relating from the bomb that, was, that uh, created significant damage in government headquarters in, in, in central Oslo uh, prior to uh, the massacres at, uh, at Utøya. So at Utøya, there's now uh, quite a moving memorial um, to the victims of, of Breivik's uh, terrorist attacks, because they, these were, you know, uh, innocent teenagers killed in, in cold blood. Yeah. yeah.
uh, and completely defenseless, right? So. And so this is very difficult, trying to uh, understand what were, you know, you started us off with the traumatic, uh, uh, up even at the most young age of a father leaving, mother maybe not um, raising the child uh, that well, and then having all these other... Um, uh, yeah, but the current things, argument uh, here is, yes, yes. Is, is always, and, uh, and it's important to emphasize that, you know, if, even in, in, in a prosperous country, uh, with an advanced welfare state such as, as, as Norway, uh, quite a number of, 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 of children experience trauma during their youth, right? Uh, dysfunctional parents, uh, what, what, what not. Uh, but uh, it, it very rea rarely leads to those kind of, of consequences, right? So, yeah, there's so many variables. Uh, mm -hmm. We've heard about tumors pressing against people's amygdala. We've heard about uh, buying guns on, on black markets uh, where there's no background checks, no ID checks. Um, we've heard about conspiracy theories and what that leads to, propaganda and phobia of others. There's all mm -hmm. different types of variables that go into um, these types of analyses. And wow, um, I'm curious your thoughts on this because um, you know, given the context of us uh, moving into a 8 billion person globalized uh, world where artificial intelligence and robotics is permeating into every single um, industry, um, we have this, uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but we have this, in a sense, we're kind of in many ways, Oslo is kind of different, at least I haven't been yet, but mm -hmm. I uh, hear and I see when I see Google Maps and all this type of stuff, just this m much more uh, uh, five million people in a, in a massive country and like uh, a little bit more focus on uh, not choking out the natural environment in a mm -hmm. sense, whereas mm -hmm. here it's just just stacking people on top of each other, choking out natural environment, less parks, less tree, etc. So like in many ways, it's like looking at indigenous principles of interconnectedness, immediate mm -hmm. return hunter gatherers, all this type of stuff, sacredness of the land and each other, and trying to embed those into metropolises as we move forward into that a crazy AI age. How do you feel about that big mixing pot with the amount of people, globalization, artificial intelligence, um, trying to bring principles of indigeneity and move them into modernity. How do you feel about all that? Uh, that that's uh, admittedly a challenging question, <laughs> given that uh, you know that this is not you know part of my anthropological competencies. Uh, but I, I I I I do think that in in sort of wider context, uh, uh, also in the context of, of debates of, of, on climate change and environmentalism, uh, there's this sense that, that uh, Norway is exceptional and stands apart. But we, we do have this uh, you know, state-controlled petroleum mm. company known as Equinor, uh, which is listed among the 50 worst uh, polluters in, in the world, right? Mm. Uh, and and so uh, even in Norway, uh, which is an advanced ec economy, right? We have, I, I, I do think there's more Teslas per capita uh, <laughs> in, in, Norway. In, in, in Norway than in uh, most other countries, right? Uh, Tesla per capita. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that. So uh, I, I, I do think, you know, uh, that there are some serious challenges uh, as far as Norway is concerned uh, as well, and that we're not, you know, uh, as much ahead of the game as it, or as far as the struggle against climate change is concerned, as, as many people uh, in other parts of the world uh, looking at Norway from the outside would, would like to think, right? Um, and there are also, you know, serious issues relating to, uh, you know, uh, conflicts over land rights uh, for the indigenous Sami population in, 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 in Norway, which uh, historically has also been uh, victims of, of uh, 
uh, what we refer to as processes of ra racialization, where they were, you know, historically seen as uh, not not Norwegian. Uh, in fact, ex experienced you know centuries of forced assimilation and and discriminatory language policies. So much so that that Sami children were not permitted to uh, speak their own language in in Norwegian schools in their home areas uh, until the late 1960s, right? Mm. And, and there's obviously, you know, uh, in, in the current context, there's, there's a lot of uh, things to learn, I think, uh, from indigenous uh, pop populations, uh, especially in regard to, and I'm saying this not in order to romanticize this, uh, because uh, that often happens, but 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 there's certainly uh, uh, things to learn about, you know, interaction with with uh, the natural environment, which uh, you know, urbanized Norwegians uh, uh, may not be as attuned to as as they should be, right? Mm. What do you think is next for your interest in social anthropology and where you want to study? Well, I mean, you know, that also depends on, 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 on funding streams. But I, I have this chance now to go back to, uh, to South Africa ne next year for a sort of revisit. We have obtained funding for... A, a project on what what we've termed global flows of Islamophobia, so I'm part of a research team, uh, and and uh, my idea is to uh, next year hopefully go back to to South Africa for a revisit. Uh, hmm. The global flows of Islamophobia. Yeah. So wow. the the underlying idea here is that one often all too often. Uh, one analyzes this in the specific nation state context right uh, what is what is then often missed in research on that phenomenon is the ways in which you know uh, social media flows for example means that particular ideas about Islam and Muslims are uh, become transnational right you can find them in 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 quite different parts of, of, of the world, right? So um, you can find some of the same ideas uh, among Hindu nationalists in India, uh, Hindutva uh, uh, people, and, and among Buddhists in, in Myanmar. Some of the same ideas about Islam and, and, and Muslims, which are sort of stereotypes, right? Uh, but there is a flow in all directions of these uh, particular ideas, and, and, and that has to be studied empirically. Mm. And this um, is part of the uh, Kifo? Well, I'm, I'm based at Kifo, which is an independent uh, research institute, right? So we mainly do commissioned research, other kinds of, of research, but this is you know, one of the, the uh, key projects that we have obtained funding for, uh, for for coming years, yeah. And what are the other macro things that KIFO is looking at? Well, as a, we're reasonably small, right? So we mostly do commissioned research in, in the field of, uh, you know, Christianity and various li uh, life stance communities uh, in, in Norway. Uh, kind of short-term projects uh, designed to say something about, you know, uh, specific topics related to uh, Christianity, uh, other life stances, other religions in in, in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, Sindra, I have another question. What do you think is most beautiful? Well, right now, uh, 
the most be beautiful I can think of is Vancouver, <laughs> right? I had this wonderful bike ride through Stanley Park uh, some three hours yesterday, uh, which was, you know, given the weather here uh, right now, quite extraordinary. And, and it's kind of, uh, you know, I, that comes from my upbringing also in Norway, where the outdoors has been uh, extremely important uh, for me. So uh, uh, that was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Mm. And most beautiful. <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> place is so magical. Mm. Um, my goodness, just a ridiculously big recommendation to people to check out Vancouver, British Columbia. <laughs> I mean, wow. Mm. Uh, there's just, there's really just nothing that just pops like what you look at when you look at like North Vancouver across the mm. water and just, it just feels like the mountains and trees are just talking to you and the water is just talking to you mm -hmm. and the sunlight's just so gorgeously shining on it. It was just, yeah, it was so beautiful. Um, Sindra, thank you for joining us on the program. Yeah. This has been an honor. Thank you. And thank you for having me. You're super welcome. I'm feel, I feel like just a bunch of new ways of seeing things is how I feel right now. And thank you for sharing all of those with us. Everyone, thank you for tuning in and checking out the program. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on all the things that Drew is teaching us. Check out his links in the bio below and support him. Let us know on all these complex topics that he was sharing what you think. Check out the links in the bio below to the American Anthropological Association. Go and support them and help them grow and flourish as well. You can find our links in the bio below as well at the simulation so you can continue doing cool things like coming on site to the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting and doing cool partnerships with people like them. Support us, PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency, all those links are in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Okay. That's right. it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>